God has called us as his people to lives of humble service through which we can give our praise and thanksgiving to our Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are blessed to be a family that is growing by his grace, and we thank God for the blessing of new members uh, to our family of faith. You know, I think people are looking for places to belong and a place to feel comfortable, a place to feel uh, welcomed with grace, to be encouraged in their lives of faith. And people are not impressed by a church that views itself as a country club for saints. But what we all need is church to be a hospital for sinners. That's what I need the church to be. That's what you need the church to be. And by God's grace, that is what this church is, that we are all broken people and that God in his mercy is near to the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. I love that about our God. You know, it's, it's amazing sometimes in life when you near the end of earthly life, what really doesn't matter takes a way, way, way far back seat. And what really does matter starts coming to the front. And we notice that sometimes with final conversations that we have with loved ones. Maybe you remember being there in the room with a mom, a dad, a a grandma, a grandpa, maybe even a son or daughter when they were nearing the end of their earthly journey. Last Friday was with Jerry Tingley and his brother as they were in the room with their mom, Carolyn, uh, who was laid to rest in Terre Haute yesterday. But she, on the final day of her life, we didn't know if it was going to be her last day. You never have that guaranteed. Only the Father knows. And yet she spent time talking with her family about how proud she was of them, how much she loved them. And she talked about the importance of faith in her life, the faith that she was dedicated to and to make sure that as a single mom raising her kids that, that they knew and loved the Lord Jesus And I will never forget some of the last words that she shared came from that old hymn, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. And she faced a tomorrow that is in heaven. Do you have any experience with that, with people's last words in your life? My grandpa Alexander, he was a character, and uh, he enjoyed life to the very, very end as he had lived for a few years in a nursing home. And my dad would go out and visit with him at the nursing home nearly every night. And on the final night of his life, they had had a conversation about how good God had been to them. And my dad said, Dad, Pops, God sure has been good to us. And Grandpa said, He sure has. He sure has. And then that night, he fell asleep in Jesus. I think about a story that I learned many years ago that I want to share today about the end of the earthly life of our forebearer, Martin Luther. Luther, the great Christian reformer, was nearing the end of his earthly life. And in late January of 1546, he had been battling quite a few different illnesses, and he knew that his earthly journey was about over. And so he focused on things like reconciling family members who were caught up in a dispute, and also writing out his last will and testament. And and his last will and testament began with these words. He said, I am well known in heaven, on earth, and even in hell, Luther wrote. A true statement of the result of his bold stance throughout life. But then Luther, the bold one, neared the end of his journey. And he was gathered together with his friends, and he happened to be in the same town where he was born, in Eisleben, Germany. And in his final moments, Luther was asked by a friend named Justice Jonas, Dr. Luther, do you want to die standing firm on Christ and the doctrine as you have taught? And Luther, with gusto, said, yes. And his final words recorded for history are these, we are beggars, this is true. We are beggars. This is true. Spoken by Luther in his final words on February 18th of 1546. Luther had an impact throughout his life. As a matter of fact, there's proof of that when you just look at our church sign because his name is incorporated into the name of this Christian congregation 
and thousands upon thousands of churches like ours throughout the world. A Lutheran is not one who worships Martin Luther, but carries on in the Christian tradition of Luther, that we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, not by works, but by God in Christ who reveals Himself to us in Scripture alone. You see, I love that. We are beggars, this is true. That really at the end of his journey, Luther would have had many things to say to God. Look at all I've done for you. Look at the bold stand I made for you. Look how much I taught. Look how many sermons I wrote and preached. Look at how many people I baptized and communed. And yet he didn't. In the quiet moments of his final breaths, he simply muttered, we are beggars, this is true because he is a child of God and a recipient with hands opened to receive the grace of the Father. We're beggars. This is true. Jesus himself is talking about those who are recipients of amazing grace. When in Luke chapter 14, he had been invited, as we heard today, to the home of a prominent Pharisee, and they were watching him carefully. They weren't just wanting to learn from Jesus. They were looking to trap Jesus. And Jesus begins that time in the Pharisee's house by healing a man with an abnormal swelling of his body because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law thought it was a big, big, big no-no to do work on the Sabbath day. And yet they had forgotten that, that man wasn't supposed to treat Sabbath as a rule but Sabbath rest is a blessing given to mankind by God. And so he did good on the Sabbath day, which you would think that anyone would celebrate the fact that here is a man who was suffering and he was healed on the day of rest and they would rejoice. But Jesus knew that their hearts were cold and calloused and they were all about posturing and positioning themselves to think that somehow they could earn God's favor. And so what does Jesus do next? He observes people coming in and taking their seats at the Pharisees' banquet. And then he starts speaking, and in Luke chapter 14, verse 10, Jesus says this. He says, well, when you are invited to a feast, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place, and then you will be honored in the presence of all of the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We could say this, for all those who self-promote themselves will be demoted, but those who are demoted will be promoted. You see what happens there? That people think that they have earned a right to sit in luxury, that they believe that they have earned their place of honor and glory. And in so doing, they're humiliated when the next person comes along and the host says, no, that's their seat. Get out of their seat and go take a lower position. You see, Jesus looks at that arrogance, and the arrogance is on display among the religious elite in his day. As I am convicted by the Word of God, some of Jesus' harshest criticism were for Pharisees and the teachers of the law, which were the back-in-the-day equivalents of clergymen and theological scholars. And so I've got to take a hard look at that as a clergyman myself and say, okay, before I want to go throw a bunch of stones at other people, what is Jesus saying to me? Instead of worrying about what everyone else is doing wrong, what is Jesus doing to me to convict me of my sin and then relieve me and forgive me of that sin by His grace? And so, when we look at this arrogance on display, we will see the contrast that Jesus sets up, because the contrast to arrogance is humility. The contrast to self-promotion is personal demotion for the sake of lifting another up. And so, Jesus is going to teach us that created and then opened by God, faith can be understood as a hand holding on to Jesus and to His promises. Every time I think of a hand holding on to something, I think of a little kid holding on to a parent's hand, or I think of someone coming to the bedside of a dying relative and holding their hand as they pray for them. I also think of one of my first personal encounters with death 
when I was a pastoral intern in 2003. And one of the men that I was calling upon during my vicarage year was named Howard Heil. And Howard was an amazing man of faith. And I also loved Howard because he played collegiate baseball and was a fan of the St. Louis Cardinals. So we had a lot to talk about. We talked about faith. We talked about baseball. We talked about life. And he knew that as a young pup preacher, I had never picked up a golf club before. And so in one of his dying breaths, before he entered into rest with Jesus, he, he rolled up a towel in his hospice room, and he showed me how to put my hands to hold a golf club. He says, you got to hold it like this and this and this. And make sure you're keeping your head down. And he was giving me all the pointers and tips that he could offer because he wanted to help a young pup preacher with his golf ministry because golf is not a sport I enjoy playing anymore, but when I did, it was part of my ministry of encouragement. Go golfing with Pastor Jeff, you'll feel very good about your golf game. That was a ministry of encouragement, and it's true. But I go back to Howard Heil. He showed me how to hold on to that club, and I didn't do it well, but he tried to instruct me. Faith is a lot like taking a grip of something that's placed into your hands. And so if God, through His grace, has given us faith, that faith takes hold of what God in His grace has offered. And so grace is God's unmerited favor, His forgiveness for our sin, His redemption of our lives. And through faith that is created and opened by God, we hold on to the promises of Jesus. We don't exalt ourselves. We humble ourselves through lives of faith. We read on in verse number 12 of Luke 14, then Jesus said now to his host, so he's speaking to a Pharisee who is among the group of people that is ultimately going to come after Jesus and find a way to put him to death. So he says to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors, because if you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus is saying, look at those who are oftentimes on the outside looking in. And instead of just showing kindness to those who are kind to you, or being with those who you feel comfortable with, Go and extend an invitation and build a relationship with someone who is very different from you and who may oftentimes be on the outside looking in. We all know what it's like to maybe not be included in a social gathering, but imagine what it would feel like if you had some kind of issue in your life that oftentimes kept you on the outside looking in and never receiving an invitation never getting asked to go out to dinner, never getting invited to have a cup of coffee, never being engaged in a polite conversation because, well, we don't know how to relate to those people, or they don't speak our language, or I don't really like their values, or, you know what, I, w I wouldn't know how to act. I'm afraid that I would say something wrong and offend them, and and I'd hate to do that. And so they're different from us. They look different. They talk differently. They may come from a different land. They may be indeed handicapped and on the outside of some of those norms of society. And yet, what is Jesus saying to the host of the feast? He says, don't invite those who are like you or who you like because they will just pay you back and it will just be showing love to those who love you. But I think of what Jesus says at other parts of the Gospels where he says, you know, go and, and do unto others as you would have them do to you. And what, what good is it if you go and show love to those who love you? Go show love to someone who mistreats you. Then let's talk. And so the power of the gospel is the fact that God in his love came to us who are so different from him. Came to us dead in trespasses and sins and he made us alive in Christ. He who is holy and just came to us who are unholy and unjust, who are the outsiders. And he says, be outsiders no more. For inside the family of faith there is room for you as a brother, as a sister in Christ. He takes us from being an outsider and he says, I'm going to make you my child. 
And your ultimate identity is who you are in Christ Jesus and in his grace. For faith acknowledges that God is the gracious giver. Here's grace, and here are your open hands as a beggar. We're beggars, this is true. And grace given into my hands because you and I are graced recipients. We've been graced amazingly by the amazing grace of an amazing giver. And that is what the invitation looks like when we go to those who may need a friend, but may be on the outside looking in. In humility, we say, I'm going to extend mercy to you because God has first extended mercy to me. I love how the reading that is assigned for us in Hebrews today matches up with the story from Luke. And the lectionary that we follow, that a lot of churches follow, uh, is a three-year lectionary that lays out Scripture readings from Old Testament books, New Testament books, and then always a reading from one of the Gospels. And so, a lot of times these are put together so that thematically they make sense. And so, this is one of those situations where these are parallel passages that make sense when they're read together. The writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 13 says, keep on loving one another. How? As brothers and sisters. Have you ever fought with your brother? Have you ever been mad at your sister? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, don't you know? But you come back together in love and forgiveness because you're members of a family. So it is with us. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. Check this out. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. That's one of the wilder scriptures that you'll ever find. Whoa, why do I want to care for my brother or sister in need? Well, when I'm showing hospitality, you never know who you're entertaining. Wouldn't it be awesome to get to heaven and God's like, you remember that time, that one person that just showed up and you were nice to him? Yeah, yeah, I sent him, right? So you never know, you never know. Uh, Abraham entertained angels in the Old Testament. Verse 3, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. And so humble faith is not just about me and Jesus, it's about me within the family of believers extending mercy to those in the inside of the family or those who are on the outside of the family because we too have been shown incredible mercy. So if you think about a person who really has it rough in life, for example, someone who's incarcerated, how do you in humble faith respond to that? Well, you don't want to be incarcerated yourself. You may not even have a chance to visit them, but how can you in word and action treat them as if you were with them in prison? That's humble faith. That's the extension of mercy. That through writing a note or sending of a, of a quilt or a care package or in prayer coming alongside of someone who is in a time of hardship and through that gift of praying for them, extending them mercy. What about those who are mistreated, those who are cast out, those who are in not invited to the banquet? Treat them, look upon them as if it were you yourself who is suffering. So instead of us saying, well, that person was a jerk to me, so I'm going to be a jerk to them. We say, I didn't like it when they were a jerk to me, so I'm not going to be a jerk to them. I hated it when my older brother or sister was mean to me, so when it's my turn to be an older brother or sister, I'm going to do things a little bit differently. I didn't like how my boss treated me when I was coming up through the organization, so when I have a position with others under me, I'm going to serve them in love. I'm going to do things differently. Treat others as you yourselves would want to be treated. Extending mercy. Why? Because humble faith holds on to the grace of God, but then extends that grace, extends that mercy, releases that mercy, shares that mercy with others. Hebrews 13, verse 15 and 16. Through Jesus... Therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. 
You see the importance of a humble faith that we are beggars, this is true, yes. But we go to the fellow beggar and we say, if God has been merciful to me, I'm going to be merciful with you. You know, when we gather together and worship like we do on Sundays, and our worship service concludes after an hour or hour and 15 minutes, our service truly is just getting started. For setting the tone for your week in God's house is setting an example for yourself and for others of what it means to honor God with all of your life. But that especially includes how do you continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. And notice what sacrifice of praise is worship to the Father, to doing good and sharing with others, giving mercy to others, because we ourselves have been recipients of amazing mercy. Thinking about the end of Luther's life and the end of other people's lives that we may have been blessed to witness. I'm reminded of a a former member of our congregation, Kurt Holstein. And Kurt is the father of Pastor Bruce, who is one of our children's church leaders. And many of you know Bruce and Ellen, wonderful servants of God. Well, Bruce was raised by wonderful parents who are now with Jesus, Kurt and Mary. Many of you knew Kurt. Some people knew Kurt because he always was dressed to the nines. He worked in his career at L.S. Ayers, downtown Indianapolis, in the men's department. And boy, did he always look sharp. We used to have seats over here where the praise team is, and Kurt and Mary would sit there, and he would always be wearing a suit and tie, and he took pride in how he looked. But you know what was amazing about Kurt and Mary? As I got to know them as their pastor, they were people of very, very humble, living faith. And as the end of Kurt's life neared, his boys and their families were gathered at the hospital, Community South Hospital. And right at the end of Kurt's life, do you know what he did? He had lifted up his hands as he was on his bed, and he kind of sat up, and he had looked towards the heavens. And shortly thereafter, he died. And even when they were unspoken, Those words were saying very much, I believe, what Luther said. We're beggars. It's true. And the life that God had given to him, he was now surrendering back to the Father of all goodness. We're beggars. We're recipients of amazing, amazing grace. And in that mercy, we extend it to others because God has extended it to us.